Good afternoon. Welcome to a surprise episode of, of Duner's Guide Through Merkwood. I wasn't planning on doing this, but the way that things happened in the ether, it decided it was necessary. We got a really good story to tell everybody today. So um, um, we have Malcolm Tent with us. We have my buddy Mike Akavoni. Um, welcome, guys. Um, so, so far in this show, when I met with Ike Willis, he, he really brought us into the uh, you know intimate moments when he met Frank Zappa. And then with Andre and Ed Palermo, you know, Andre did the same, brought us his moment of Zappa where he made him laugh. And Ed Palermo told his tales of traipsing around New York to see, you know, Billy the Mountain and, and see Zappa all over the place. Um, and then yesterday, Malcolm shared with us, I'm sorry, Sunday, Malcolm shared with us his, you know, off the cuff going to see Frank, ended up front row, getting busted, trying to tape it, like rerun in, uh, in, <laughs> in fast, all right, yeah, good times. Um, and then, you know, yesterday I, I was speaking to Mike and, uh, and he brought up a story about Frank Zappa. Um, that I felt really needed to be told. I had never heard it. Um, it, it. It's really towards the end of Frank's life in the last year. Um, so I brought Mike on, and, and Malcolm was involved in the story too, happened to be. So, uh, you know, Malcolm agreed to come back. Um, so let's go ahead and discuss it. Uh, it's, 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 it's really a powerful story. Um, actually, let me just preface this with my quote uh, for the week. So, you know, as everybody knows, Frank testified in front of Congress uh, about the PMRC and, and what they were trying to do. So I want to start the show just with a quote from his testimony. Um, so it said, the PMRC proposal is an ill-conceived piece of nonsense which fails to deliver any real benefits to children, infringes the civil liberties of people who are not children, and promises to keep the courts busy for years dealing with the interpretational and enforcemental problems inherent in the proposal's design. It's my understanding that in law, First Amendment issues are decided with a preference for the least restrictive alternative. In this concept, the PMRC's, PMRC's demands are the equivalent of treating dandruff by decapitation. So with that being said, um, Mike, let's hear your story of the PMRC and Frank and what you told me yesterday, and, and let's, let's take it over. Sure. Um, so uh, I graduated high school in 1993, and um, I, was, I was not a good student in high school. Uh, I was good at art, and I was good at math, and nothing else. I didn't, I didn't try at anything else. I didn't see the value in anything else. Um, I was also like dyslexic so I had trouble with uh, with other things um, so there were some roadblocks that kind of kept me from from doing well at some things but mostly uh, mostly I just didn't see the point in a lot of it as you know like a lot of teenagers do um, so it was a fairly disgruntled teenager which of course is not uncommon at all um, I had moved up to New York State uh, from South Florida when I was in between high school and middle school and uh, I really just never fit in and it was a small school in a small town and I just I, I never really um, re never really found a good a good like safe space to be in I think you know and I, I really think that's important um, and so um, music was always something for me that that gave me some sort of solace uh, and and things that other people weren't into and you know some angry and disgruntled punk rock and then you know like some real sarcastic like dead milkman kind of stuff and just really like you know stuff that allows you to feel like you're not alone as a teenager mm -hmm. you know sure, as someone yeah. who's not fitting into other things and that there's there wasn't in a small town not that there's anything wrong with that town i mean i hated it but there's nothing wrong with it this wasn't the right place what for town me. is it calling calling oh, new York. okay okay right, right. yeah okay. Um, so the, I just had a hard time fitting into some things or, or really feeling comfortable anywhere. So music was, was that for me. Um, and when I was a C, by the time I got to be a senior, I had to, I had, you know, when a lot of my friends had all sorts of, um, um, study halls all over the place cause they finished all the requirements. I had to keep retaking classes cause I had failed them cause I didn't see a point in learning Spanish. And I wish I had, I really wish I had. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to, to, to do English and all those things. So I had to retake a lot of classes and I really wasn't exactly on the track to graduate if I, I really had to get everything right the senior year. And I had a government class like everyone does. And, um, and his government teacher, Mr. Russo, who was, uh, he was a really great teacher uh, because he talked to, to me like, in a, like a person rather than like a kid. You know, like I think most teachers, which is natural, like you're trying to tell kids how to do it right and what to do. And, you know, the, you'll, it'll be great if you do this and your future will be bright if you follow these rules and all that. And 
Like, I just didn't see it that way. Uh, but Mr. Mr. Rayhag was that way. Mr. Rayhag was that way too, right? He, he would talk to us like we're people, right? Yeah, that makes a big difference. And as, and I am, you know, full disclosure, and ironically, I am a high school teacher now. I was going to save that for the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I think there's value in that in teach in, in yeah. talking to kids that they're people and right. that their opinions matter, but also explaining them the ramifications for their actions and let them make their choices rather than lecturing them yep. to it, but, you know, whatever. So Mr. Rus Russo pulled me aside and was like, Hey man, if you don't, if you don't knock this government project out of the park, you are not going to graduate. And what, what's going to become, become of you if you don't graduate high school, do you want to come back to this place you hate for another year? Or do you want to wander around and try to find work as a non high school graduate? Or do you want to go to college? Whatever it is you want, like you're not going to graduate high school if you don't knock this out of the park. I really appreciated that he talked to me like that. Like not, there was no lecture. There was no talking down. It was like, this is the situation. Facts. Just talking the facts. Yeah, here's the facts. Make your decision. And I, and that was great. And so there was a list of, I don't know how many topics you could pick for your government project, which was a year long, like a big project. And they all, like, none of them interest me, but one of Dry, them. Dry, boring, right? Yeah. It just, you know, to, like, everything would be exactly what you, what you would think of a yeah. high school government project. But one of them was music censorship. And I was like, oh, man, I have got to get that. Because if, yeah. I don't get that, if I don't get that, any of these other ones, I'm probably not going to do it. Right. Like, I don't, you know, I just wouldn't find the value in it. So... Uh, the day you got to pick your your topic, it was first come, first serve, and whoever was the first one into his room in the morning gets to pick the first topic. So I got up early, and I got to school like an hour early, and I just sat on the floor in front of his door because I was like, I have to get this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that anyone else would have wanted it because I, <laughs> I didn't know I mean, it was a small class and like, you know, some, some good people and everything, but nobody... You were focused. You knew what you had to do to make it happen. I was really focused and I didn't know anyone who kind of like in that teenage, like lived and died by their music kind of way other than myself, you know, as just like my solace, you know, so I really needed it. So I got it, um, you know, and he, and he told me again, he's like, don't, don't mess this up. Like there's not extra... I'm not doing it for you. I'm not doing you any favors. You can do this. I know you can do this. So that, that was good. So then I was like, all right, I got the topic that I want. And so now what? Like, do I like read newspapers? Like, how do I get this information? <laughs> Go on the I internet, Matt. Google it. Just Google it. Right. Yeah. But I, you know, <laughs> well before the of the internet, of course, our, our <laughs> library is, was like the size of a garage. You know, right. it's not like right. that was. Uh, so. At that point in my life, um, I had a car and I, you know, I had, I had a job to get a car so I could have a little bit of freedom. And I had been going to Trash, Malcolm's store, uh, I mean, religiously, like once a week from the, from like that first week I had a driver's license. And there just wasn't any, you know, the only other alternative was going to the mall to buy music, which is a possibility. I mean, they had some of the stuff I wanted, but that was it. And, and I think I want to say, I want to say, Mike, it was probably Chris Haley. If you, obviously you remember Chris, of course Haley. I remember Chris. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I would almost bet money that it was him who brought me to trash the first time. Oh, I'm sure I, that would make sense. The, for the first time from then on out, like that was it. I was hooked any, any money I spent on music. And that's really the only money I spent was on music was, you know, once a week going to trash and like, buying some CDs or buying some concert t-shirts or just finding out about, you know, concerts that were going on or whatever. It was. Well, there's new seven inches coming out, new releases all the time. Malcolm had, you know, used collections coming in. It was just such a you know, yeah. vortex of just awesome, you know, of, of culture and art. Right. And, yeah. yeah. As, well, as a, you know, as a teenager in a small town who didn't feel like he belonged in that town, uh, that was a place that it felt like I, be I, I wasn't an outsider in that place. If nope. anything, I wasn't like weird enough for that place. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I had, I was, man, I, better, I need some expertise. I'm going to go outside and rip my clothes up a little bit. I'll be back. I'll be a little more yeah, respectable I, I to the trash. A, I bought a used pair of combat boots there that didn't really fit me, but I was like, you know, I didn't know where else to buy combat boots. 
Um, and I certainly <laughs> wasn't going to go spend like a hundred bucks on, no, on no. Zach Martin. It was like, yeah. that would be all my music money. So like, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, so it was, a, I re- went there regularly and religiously, any chance I got. And uh, it, it, man, at least once a week, it wasn't that close to Pauling. I mean, it was, you know, on the outskirts of Danbury. So it was a good, I don't know, 45 minutes or something. But when you live in a small town, that's not, that's not a great distance, you know. Uh, so I went into trash and I was like, well, these guys will, these guys will help me. And so uh, Malcolm, of course, was there as he, I believe, was there every single time I went into trash. <laughs> um, and so I said, hey, uh, I'm, I am have to do a project on music censorship. Like, do you, do you know anything? Yeah, like, can you help me? Like, what should I do? And, uh, you know, I don't remember the exact same conversation, but uh, Malcolm uh, was told me, uh, write a letter to Barking Pumpkin Records and write a letter to, um, God, what's Jello Alternative, alternative Tentacles. Alternative Tentacles. And so um, I, I, I think I'm remembering this correctly. I think you even wrote down the addresses for me. I probably did. That like, sense. I had like these addresses. And so like I go home and I'm like, you know, dear Mr. Zappa, you know, <laughs> and I didn't know, I didn't know anything about Greg Zappa. Nothing. That was not my, in my wheelhouse. I was definitely more into, in like the early nineties end of like punk alternative music. And right. that wasn't Frank Zappa. I wasn't, I mean, I knew I had heard the voice and all that, but I, I wasn't into his music. Uh, I did know Jell-O I offer, of course, but uh, so I sent, the letters uh, I didn't get anything back from Jello by Opera, which is fine but my like dear Mr. Zappa can you help me you know graduate high school or whatever I can't imagine what I put in that letter other than like a super like please help me kind yeah. of thing uh, and then you know whatever a couple weeks later I got a, a envelope in the mail it was like it was like this thick a big manila envelope uh-huh. from Barking Pumpkins Records and um it was, I mean, it was so many pages of newspaper articles and speeches and things that he had written. And it was all, you know, badly photocopies, Mm -hmm. you know, if you get the pictures of him, that's so like contrasty that all you see is like the mustache or, you know, whatever with him and a tie on sitting in front of Congress or whatever. Uh, And it was, I mean, it was everything I needed to do my government project. That's Uh, so amazing. it, It really was. It was, it was fantastic. And so, um, I knocked this project out of the park, man. I like would not have done it without that material. I would have, I assume, I'd like to think I would have done enough to graduate without that, but, but he literally handed me all the tools to do it. Uh, and I, and again, I didn't, I was not a fan. I didn't really know Frank Zappa and he signed the letter. It was like, you know, I can't remember, and I do have it at home. I'm not oh, home my now, God, and we got to see that. We got to see that I, letter. I will pick it up. You know, my, it's in a box. My parents... Um, it should be in a frame on your wall. <laughs> it should be. It's, you know, they, they delivered me, uh, now that I have a basement at home, uh-huh. they have started, like, every time they come see me, they would bring me another box of, like, crap. And that if I never saw those things again, I wouldn't miss them. But if they, they handed it to me, so now I'm like, oh, I can't throw away my, like, Star Wars toys but I also don't need or really want them, but there's some weird nostalgia there. And in one of the boxes was all my like high school yearbooks and stuff, which I definitely don't need. But then I found the, the folder with uh, my entire government project in there. So cool. I can't wait uh, and to he see signed that. it, you know, like whatever. I mean, I, I mean, he probably didn't type out the note himself. I, I assume, you know, assistance or whatever, but it was like, here's, here's what you might need, you know, best of luck FZ with the, you know, the big, uh, FZ written in a Sharpie or something. So your path to graduation went from Carmel to Pauling to Danbury to California and back to you through Malcolm and Frank Zappa. That's just yeah. incredible. That's just incredible. Malcolm, what, yeah. what do you think? What do you think, man? Do you remember? You don't remember that. I'm sure that's, you've talked to so many kids back then <laughs> advising them, but do, do you have any in, in a re- recollection of that or no? None whatsoever. <laughs> that's in, that's in, on brand though, right? That's total on brand Malcolm Tent. <laughs> Well, but that's, but that's, that's what I would have done. I mean, Absolutely. you know, that, that's what my stock and trade was, was helping out these kids who exactly as he's describing had pretty much nowhere to go, no resources, um, pre-internet, 
Mm -hmm. And really, even in this age of the internet, nothing will ever replace having a gathering point, like where you can actually meet people and talk to them face to face, exchange ideas. I mean, it's been historically proven that the marketplace is the oldest gathering point for, hum for human beings. This goes Makes back sense. to prehistoric times and nothing's ever going to change that. You know, and, and you see that nowadays in, in these unprecedented times, people are bemoaning the lack of a place to go. And so, especially back at that time when we were pretty much the only game in town, I was always acutely aware of that, mm -hmm. you know? And so the door was always open. Everybody was always welcome. And anybody who needed anything resembling advice or whatever, we were there. That's just, that's what we were there for. That's what we did. And that was my way of paying back all of the great record stores that uh, were around in South Florida when I was a kid. You know, I'd go to, I mean, you know, Pauling, I haven't spent much time there, but I'm sure it was uh, at least as alienating as South Florida was. And um, South Florida, where I grew up, was pretty goddamn alienating, let me tell you. So to have places like Open Books and Records, Yesterday and Today Records, Underground Records, Yardbird Records, for a teenager such as myself to go and talk to my elders and get advice and get feedback and get guidance for anything from when's the new Celtic Frost record coming out to um, what's wrong with my cat, you know? I mean, it, it could have been anything. So I had these places to go and these people to talk to, and I always wanted to repay that. And the kind of unexpected dividend as we're finding right now from this story is paying it forward and yep. seeing how you cast your bread upon the waters and they come back, which is really, really cool. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm loving hearing this. This is a great story. It was, it was, I mean, your, your store, you know, that and the, uh, kind of, I've been trying all day to remember the name of the, the radio station from Danbury. Um, WXCI. Ah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> 91.7. Um, that's right. Um, and, and listening to that and then going to, to shows and, and, and having, you know, Danbury, it wasn't that close, but that was as close to like a, a music scene as the, as there was the Pauling. Um, Poughkeepsie just seemed too dangerous at the time, I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sure it was, but, uh, well, it's been worse but, now you can be sure of that. Yeah. Those things were important. I mean, I'm, you know, the first time I went into that store was definitely intimidating, but like just the first time, you know, like going in, cause I had never been into a place like that before. And I was like, what yeah. do you mean? What is this? Like they sell you stuff and music and like shoes and shirts and uh, like everything. Yeah. Um, but then and it yeah. became a breath of fresh air, right? It always became a breath of fresh air, just like, oh, it was. Right. And there you wasn't, know, it wasn't like a store where you felt like, oh, if I don't buy something, this is weird. Or I got to get what I need to get out of here. You know, it's like, I'm yeah, going to buy an album, it's going to take 20 minutes or a half hour because I'm going to end up having conversations about yeah, anything. Never, you know, yeah, and that, that's, a, that's a crucial point because I, I never, ever, ever have viewed myself as being a salesman. I never viewed myself as being somebody there to make the sale. I've, I've always viewed myself as being a conduit. Conduit, yep. You Absolutely. know, to get what you need, and I'm just the medium, you know? And I honestly never cared if anybody bought anything or not. I figured if they were gonna buy, they're gonna buy. If they're not, somebody else will, hmm. you know? And I had to be there from noon to eight every day anyway, <laughs> so why not just be here? Yeah. And then hang out and talk and have fun and learn, not just teach and be didactic, but learn as well, you know, and keep this exchange of information going. And I think that's what our, our, our true value and our true strength really was more so than just desperately trying to make a sale. You know, we just, and, and that never registered with me. It never made any sense to me. I never liked going into places like that. No, it always seems like you're trying to match the right person with the right media or the right art, the right book or the right, you know, whatever the conversation would be and take you and, and oh yeah, I got this over here, this over here. And yeah, it was, yeah. It was magical in that way. And you it's know, funny, I, the reaction, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say like, as, a, as an adult who started collecting actual vinyl again, maybe five years ago, 
Um, and I do a lot of traveling, which I, lo I love to do um, for a lot of different reasons, but I'm always looking for record stores in whatever city I'm going to. And I've definitely come across record stores who like, like they're almost like they're trying to be intimidating. You know, like mm. the like the high fidelity model of like <laughs> test you out to see if you're cool, and uh, and I'm always like, what the fuck is that? Like, what do you, you know? And I I don't give a shit what you think of me. Like, if that's the way you are, then I you know I don't. This isn't the right place. I'll say more often than not, most independent record stores are welcoming places, but I do get to go into places like that. I went I went into this place in Detroit that someone had told me like, this is the best record store in Detroit. You got to go. And I went and I was, I was, I don't remember what I was asking for, but they were like real pompous about it. And I was like, okay, never mind. Like, hmm. like this is supposed to be an interaction. Like, you know, I don't know, like skit, like we should have a conversation about this, even if one of us doesn't know about it. I don't know. Like, that's what I, that's what I missed for so many years like the death of you know the 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 record store from mp3s until you know f five to ten years ago when they started you know when record stores became more viable again um i missed it so so much uh it was it was when i finally bought a record player and started started buying like all the records of my youth in vinyl which i never had in my youth i didn't have a record player you know, I had a, I had some shitty CD player because again, like I'm not spending money on equipment. I've got, I've got to buy the music, mm -hmm. you know, like I can't spend all my money on this. I, I need more CDs. Um, that, that interaction, that record store interaction where, you know, when you might buy something and someone's like, Oh, have you, Oh, you like that? Have you thought of this? Mm -hmm. Or you'd say like, Oh, like, who's that? You know, who are you playing on the radio there? And they're not just like flippant with some, snotty answer it's like oh man yeah check this out or this is something that came out at this time from this label or whatever it is like i love that so much um and as someone who's also like i don't you know i'm a i spend a lot of time alone i'm an introvert i, I like being alone um and you know these are weird times but i do miss that like when i'm in and i live in in washington dc my my favorite record store is closed right now and like my favorite thing to do once a week or once every couple weeks is to like take a long walk get some coffee walk to that record store and spend like an hour in there and maybe chat with one of the guys and flip through some records and probably buy some records but not necessarily like i miss that more than i miss anything else um Your name name what what shop is that it's called some som some records oh don't uh, know that one uh, yeah, I really like the guy. Um, it's it's a really cool spot, like right in the middle of town. And uh, often when a when a, a kind of a low uh, smaller bands come through town, they'll stop in there and kind of hang out a little. And like, uh, and which is kind of cool. You see him like chatting with someone, and I'm like, hey, who was that? And you know, he's like, oh man, that was Calexico. You know, yeah. they just came in to chat. I'm like, that's yeah. so cool. You know, and even that, there was no there's no air of pretension about it. He was like, oh, you like him? Go talk to him, you know? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm not the kind of like starstruck guy to be like, I love your records, but like, that's really cool that those guys are in there. And I miss that so much. And I, and I hope in some way that there are places like that still for kids who were 16 and feeling so alienated that the only thing that they can relate to is, a, is songs that maybe no one else gives a shit about, you know? Yeah, it, it's there. It's there. I mean, I've I've talked to um, talked on my previous broadcast about how I'm a, a touring musician these days, and I play all over the country, and I've been to Europe, and um, I go to the record stores in every single town I play, usually, and I've seen a lot of that kind of interaction, yeah, um, literally all over the place, you know, and it, it makes me it brings me a lot of joy to report that the record store is very much alive and well and record stores are still hubs for that kind of interaction and that kind of communication. And I've, I've seen it, you know, I've seen the, 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 the lost kids hanging out there at the counter and listening and learning and putting the, the, the connection together and connecting the dots. And it's really, it's really nice, very nice thing to see. 
Very yeah, it, it's, yeah. It, I think it's important, man, because uh, t- be, being a teenager sucks. And if you just feel, if you feel like you don't belong somewhere, like you got to find it somewhere. Sure. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that, that was a, that was, a, and it still is, but that Changed was the trajectory of your life, point. obviously. Right, Mike? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, really, really good. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome stuff, guys. Well, this, this has just been so great to, to bring, bring you together to, you know, enjoy that story, Mike. And you got to come back with, uh, with the documents. I, I, I want to see the documents. I, I see that at home. Well, <laughs> I do have one more story for Malcolm. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. But Malcolm, I am, I am 99% sure that this is true. Um, I went and saw Flipper at wherever. Tuxedo, tuxedo Junction, tuxedo Junction with dwarves. Yeah, with it dwarves. might probably Tuxedo Junction. I was there. Or, I have the ticket stub right around here somewhere. Yeah. Well, th- this I like, and there was a. Tell me if you were at the show. It wouldn't surprise me if you were at the show too much. But I, I brought a friend of mine. This guy I used to drive to school, and and this kid, he was. Uh, he lived on a farm, really nice guy. Chris Lapp was his name. And uh, he was not into any of this music at all. But he was like, you know, I would tell him that I go to these concerts all the time. Like, I'll go alone. I'll go with somebody. But like, I go to as many concerts as I can. And so Flipper was coming to town. And I was like, come to see this concert with me. And we went and we got there early. And uh, so we were like killing time by playing like hacky sack and like out in the a parking lot or some something and this guy was like hey can we play hacky sack with you we're like sure and this guy was so wasted and i don't know if he was drunk or what that every time he went to kick the hacky sack he would just fall right over <laughs> like a tree just not even catch himself just go to kick and just boom we're yeah. like, and we're like well you know we're, we're all done we kind of walked away we're like that was weird so he was in the band which i had no idea <laughs> so the band comes on and they he was, I want to say he was the bass player. If I'm yeah, that was, John, that was John Doherty, the bass player of Flipper. It, like song number two, he just fell over again and he didn't get up back up. <laughs> they don't, the rest of the band seemingly doesn't give a shit. They start spitting, they start spitting on the very sparse crowd. There was not many people there. I was there, yeah. I remember. And they, the, the, the club, whatever bouncers or owners were like, this concert's over. And the guy, and they're yelling at each other and he's spitting on the, on the crowd and, and crowd is, is loose because there was maybe, you know, it's probably 50 people there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I, and you're, and you Malcolm, and, and I have such a vivid memory of this and I, I, I believe it's true. You're like elbows on the stage, like having a blast. And you like look over and you're like, this is punk rock. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, and if I remember correctly, the dwarves who opened, I think the singer jumped into the drum kit to end the set after like four or five songs. Or oh, six songs, yeah. If I remember correct. You, you guys want the story? You want to hear the story of that okay, one? Am I have it? Yes, you're, you're, you're both correct. Now I'm, gonna, I'm just going <laughs> to fill in the details and give oh, you some please. shading awesome. on everything. Awesome. Okay. Um, that show got booked maybe two weeks prior to the actual date. The, the, the venue, Tuxedo Junction, had just started doing, you know, underground shows because we had promoted Sonic Youth there. Yeah, I, I remember that, that show. I that didn't was, go to it, but I remember it happening. That was, that was a big one. It was sold out, yeah. packed house. It was like right nuts. before uh, Dirty came out. It was like... yes. They were playing it was these like, warm-up shows. Yes, it was amazing. It was one of three warm-up shows they did for the Dirty album. And so, yeah, we had whatever, close to 700 people there, everybody happy. So Tuxedos is like, well, you know, this alternative rock thing is um, a viable business model. Let's, <laughs> let's exploit this. And so the guy who promoted there, his name was Gene, he called me and said, man, I just got offered this show, uh, Flipper and the Dwarves. You think I should do it? <laughs> and I, of course, said, yeah. God damn. Uh, yeah. And he said, well, how many do you think they can draw? And, you know, I just did a, a completely sold out show with Sonic Youth and Flipper hadn't toured in years. And I, of course, love Flipper. I'm a total mark for Flipper. And so I said, um, I'm sure they can draw a couple hundred. And he said, okay, we're going to book it. So they book it with very short notice. 
and they had already had a gig at the tune in for a few days after that so the gig and i didn't know that but you can only have so many flipper shows <laughs> in western connecticut you know the market's not that big so they book the show they're on tour with the dwarves the scenario is exactly as you describe john doherty the bass player that flipper had was absolutely five or six sheets to the wind barely functioning um the crowd was very small so the dwarves and flippers said look since there's nobody here we're just going to get all together on the stage and we're all going to have a big jam session the two bands together and that'll be it so they set up all the gear for both bands to play simultaneously and the club owners wig out they absolutely freak out. They, one of them came down to the stage waving a contract saying, the contract doesn't call for this. You can't do this. The contract says two bands, two sets. If you do this, you're in violation of contract. You know, meanwhile, the bass players like, ah, <laughs> and you know, everybody else is in varying degrees of intoxication or just plain, just don't give a fuck one way or another. You know, they're the dirty most unwashed crew I've ever seen since G.G. Allen. The dwarves are there, and all they like to do is start trouble. All they want yeah. to do is just start shit wherever they go. That's the and thing. so here's Tuxedo Junction, which is used to having like big band concerts and swing concerts and the Pink Floyd tribute group. <laughs> this genuine group of freaks. Like, honest, like, no poses, man. These guys are fucked up on every level. Mm -hmm. And they don't care. You know, you've got the, the bouncers in their tuxedo shirts and suspenders, you know, <laughs> fresh off the Westcon football team, you know. And I, I knew a bunch of those guys. I had no beef with them, but it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. Completely different world. So it's like a powder keg waiting to go off. So the promoter is like, you got to play two sets. And the door was like, all right, we'll play two. You know, we'll play a set. So... <laughs> They break down the equipment, set up for the dwarves. The dwarves say, "Well, all right, they're going to make us play a, a they're going to make us play a set according to contract, but our contract only says we have to play two songs." So, they get up, they play two and a half songs. And each of their songs is like a minute and a half yeah, long. Yeah. So in the middle of the third song, they launch into the drum set, smash everything, and that's the end of the dwarves. And then the flipper show is, as you described, just the drunken falling over and mayhem. Um, Bruce Luce, the singer of Flipper, went and gave the head bouncer a full-on kiss on the lips, which <laughs> really set stuff up. That's when everything spilled outside. Hmm. And I thought for sure they were going to have a great big brawl in the parking lot. But they came back in triumphant, played the show. I mean, it was... That was a magical night. <laughs> yeah. It, you have it, it on tape? Was, yeah, it was yeah. Like the most punk rock thing I had ever seen. Yeah. And I brought this poor kid with me who had <laughs> no idea what was going on. And he was just scared. He was like, this is what it's like when you go to concerts? And I was like, not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes. That's a good one. Great, yeah. Great story. Uh, great story. Uh, well, and just to add my own personal spin to, to this this weekend, Flipper played Danbury on Thursday. I went to go see them again on Saturday in New Haven. And then the day after that, I went down to New York City to see Gigi Allen in what was his last ever show that ended in a complete riot in the streets. Oh, so that was wow. a pretty good rock and roll weekend right Guess there. Yes, so. Holy cow. Yeah. Wow. That was when all right. When it rains, it pours. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> yeah. Good stuff. Wow, what great stories, man. So anything else, Mike? Any, anything else from uh, the trash days you want to bring up or ask Malcolm? Or, You know, I just, like like I was saying, like it was an important thing to me as someone who just didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, you know? And, and again, it's not the small town's fault. That, you know, there's nothing wrong with small towns. It's just I didn't have anywhere I felt comfortable. And having a place like that and, like, that radio station and the shows in, in Danbury. And sometimes I'd even go to uh, Toad's place in New Haven or, mm -hmm. you know, for me, once I got a car and a job, I mean, I would drive hours to go to a concert. And I did, I did that for years. And my parents, I was, I'm the youngest of three. They were just tired by the time I got to high school. 
so you know they would get i would work most nights and like they would go to bed and i would come home and they wouldn't know and i i uh there was there was one time i pushed it too far I, there was a uh there was a mojo nixon concert at uh, mm. mojo nixon and the toad lickers in uh in new haven at toad's place and they didn't go on to they were doing their horny holidays tour which was just a fantastic thing um and they didn't go on till after midnight and i got home at like four in the morning Oof, that's wild. and it was like my dad was getting up for work and he was like where the hell have you been <laughs> and i was like well you know i went to a concert and they were like what do you mean you went to a concert i'm like i go to concerts all the time and they're like you can't do that on a weeknight i'm like I've been doing that for like a year. <laughs> like, too late, too yeah. late. And there was, I forget what the show was. I had tickets to the show, the uh, show the next night and I didn't go to that. Um, you know, and that, and that was it. That was like the extent of my punishment. They're like, you're not going tomorrow. And then I just was more careful about like coming home. I mean, I didn't come home drunk or anything. It was like mm -hmm. a Tuesday, you know, but it was, it was definitely like well past any reasonable, a reasonable time <laughs> uh but at, you know after that I, I was just more careful and i i went to the shows and the and the shows at the at the radio station and you know those those uh danbury bands and uh i think i only saw bunny brains once i can remember seeing him at least once and mm. like the whole circus of it which was just wonderful yeah um, those those were like great great things for me and like by the time I went off to college, I did, I felt like, I just felt like I could be myself. I didn't have to like have this weird life away from things. It was like, this is the stuff I like. This is who I am. And even when I went to school and like, you know, most people are into jam bands, like that's cool. Like I like it a little, but this is really what I like and you know, stuff like that. Or, or like Mike, I mean, God, you know, Mike here is an encyclopedia of music knowledge, and I, I, I've taken him upon it many times. I mean, I think I think he, you know, there's a bunch of tapes somewhere in a box in my garage that you probably made for me. There's a Frank Zappa tape, the uh, the the corn tape. Yeah, the, Iowa, the Iowa '84 tour. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I did the broccoli uh, in Chicago and corn in Iowa, right? Yeah. Yeah, and to, <laughs> and to bring this all back to Zappa, like I, I find out later that he, you know, his whole like counterculture movement was just was so robust and I had no idea mm. um but it, it certainly made a big difference to me uh and you know seeing where he went and all that and uh it's it's just like we you know for teenagers who who don't have a lot to like buy into you know like you know we're we're handed this system which isn't inherently bad but it, it doesn't feel like it's yours and the things you're supposed to do because it'll do be better for you later. But you know, you're told these things by people you don't trust. And like, it's, it's a tough machine for a, for a kid who's, who's not sure of things. Uh, but uh, you know, music was the thing that was always there for me and still in a very big way. Like, you know, I, I there's plenty of stuff that I listen to and I know that like my wife's not going to be interested in this. So I'm just going to put my headphones on. Mm -hmm. Or like I'm on a road trip, like great. This is just nothing but time for me and music, and like, you know, let letting music say the things that I don't know how to say. Maybe I don't know what yeah, it, but absolutely no, it's, but, it's an expression uh, and feeling. Absolutely, really, really uh, big and important things to me, uh, and I and I can't imagine what I would have done or become or what if I didn't have hadn't have found that as an outlet. You know, like Let me without, ask you this. I'm sorry. I without, just wanted to ask you a question. That's the irony being that now you're a school teacher, you're a high school teacher. How do you find yourself relating to the kids? You know, that's a good question. So, you know, not to bring up these awful times we're living in now. Um, I teach digital media at a magnet school in, in Washington, D.C. So it's a public magnet school. And 98% of my students are live in poverty and they get this opportunity to go to this magnet school and they get to specialize in something. So they're majoring, if they're with me, they're majoring in digital media. So I'm teaching them graphic design, um, Photoshop, marketing, stuff like that. Uh, the creative end of things, but also the business end of things. 
And some of them go on to do it, and that's great. Not every one of them do, but I, I get the chance to have them for three years in a row. So, and most teachers right. don't have that. Most teachers have a, a hundred plus new kids every year. And it's not easy to get to know kids or for kids to, to start to trust you. Yeah. Um, but I get them for three years and I don't connect with all of them. I don't think you can, or at least I can't. I'm just not that type of person. But there are cases where that does happen. Um, I, I just got an email just, uh, just last week uh, from an old student of mine who was like, just brought up an old story was like, hey, you remember this? And like, I really appreciated that you were really strict, like I had to do the work, but you were also helpful and funny and that you, you know, stood up for people. And that, that's so that's, you don't get that a lot, but you get it once in a while. And right now I have a kid who, um, who hasn't done any of his online work for any of his classes and he's supposed to graduate in two weeks. And, you know, there's a million emails I have to answer every day and all, all of his teachers, no one's been able to get a hold of this kid because his, he's the only English speaker in his family. Uh, so I finally, called his his mom and just kept saying Christopher until she put him on the phone. I was like, I need Christopher. And she's, and my, I still don't speak Spanish, but I just kept saying, I'm like, I need to get this kid on the phone. He's going to, he's going to not graduate. And I got him on the phone. I was like, man, you got to do this. Like you have to do this stuff. You're not going to graduate. And he was like, can you, can you help me? And I was like, yeah. Hmm. Like, what do you, yeah, of course. What do you need? And he was, he was telling, he was just too, he was overwhelmed and embarrassed and didn't know how to ask for help. And I was like, oh shit, I thought I was tracking down a lazy, I mean, I always liked this kid. I've had him for three years, but I'm like, some of them are just being lazy. And like, this kid is scared and he can't tell his parents and he can't, and he, ha he hasn't talked to any of his teachers. And I was like, yes. Uh, and so I set up a video chat with him for last night. And then I called every one of his teachers. And I was like, this is what you need to do. You need to write down a list of everything he needs to do to graduate. I'm going to make sure he does it, but you need to get that to me. And most of the teachers were like, yes, here. I had a couple who were like, I posted it to the website. And I was like, dude, like, that's not, that's not good enough here. Like, you need to, to just tell me, like, I'm working with this kid. And so I... I got him on a video chat last night. And I was like, look, Chris, we've got two weeks. Like I break this all down. You need to do three things a day. I'm like, this is what you need to do today. Cause you can't be like, you need to do these, you know, 26 things to graduate. That's too much. He's already overwhelmed. So mm -hmm. I'm like, can you do three things tonight? And he said, yes, I can do that. So I, I put him in order. I'm like, these, this is the hierarchy. I need you to do these three tonight. I'm going to call you tomorrow. And I'm also going to talk to every one of your teachers and I'm going to get you through this. But you, I was like, you can't, you can't not do this. And I was like, I, I, I know, I know it's hard. And I know, I know you're way behind. I know you're embarrassed, but like, you have to graduate. Like, I'm not going to stop. And if I have to, if I have to get my wife to call your mom to speak in Spanish, I will, but I know you don't want that. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, so there are kids like that. You know, there are kids who years later, I get an email saying, hey, you meant a lot to me. And like, that's awesome. Or there's kids like this where I'm like, holy shit, like nobody has been able to connect with this kid. And everyone's overwhelmed. Like the teachers are overwhelmed too. Like it's not an easy, nobody asked for this. Nobody knows how to deal with it. But shit, this kid is going to suffer so much if somebody doesn't do this. So, you know, that's, out of, you know, 120 kids I have right now, that's the one I'm focusing on. Most of them do the work. Some of them are lazy and whatever. So there's stuff like that. Like, you know, that's so, my... So I don't think Mr. Te Mr. Zappa's uh, actions back in September of 1992 were for naught at all. <laughs> I mean, I became a teacher when I, I hated school. I hated it so much. Yeah. The only thing I liked was, was art. Hmm. Um. And my art teacher, and my, my art teacher, I, I was in contact with him. He died a couple of years ago, but hmm. once or twice a year, I'd send him a postcard or we'd send emails back and forth. And like, he was another guy who like talked to me like an adult and not, not like some outcast kid. So, yeah. you know, there's that, I, you know, you can't connect with everybody, but 
if you find someone who needs the help or someone who's asking for it or, or whatever it is, like that's the, you know, the, the rewards for teaching are, are my own. Like I, I'm not someone who looks for, you know, a shout out at the faculty meeting or to be in the newsletter or any of that shit. I don't want that. I don't need it. I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm an introvert. I don't need to be like heralded on stage. Like I'm not interested in that at all. But like you get stuff like that and then you're like, you know, I'm going to get this kid to graduate and that's going to feel good when not a whole lot feels good right now. So there's well, that. I want to hear the story in 10 years of how he's going to pay it forward once you get him to graduate. Yeah. That's <laughs> you know, like, yeah I'm sure he's going to be touched by, like, wow, these people all came out and especially Mike. And then that, that'll be his foundation to then leap into the world. Like you had the foundation from Frank and Malcolm. Yeah, and, maybe. I hope so. Um, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's how I'm going to predict it's going to go for, for, all right. your, for your guy there. <laughs> all right, guys. So this has been an awesome conversation. Thanks a lot for joining. I really appreciate it. I definitely want to have you guys both back on the show at some point because there's so much I want to talk to both of you about different realms. Sure. So uh, we'll connect and uh, we'll plan that up. Okay. Um, so Malcolm 10, thank you very much. Mike Iacovone, thank you very much to anybody watching and listening. Have a great afternoon. Uh, regular show will be on this Sunday with uh, Jason Washington uh, coming from the uh, from Grand Cayman. He's my scuba guru, uh, National Geographic underwater photographer, uh, just amazing guy. Uh, he's like a caged tiger not being able to dive down in Cayman. Um, so he's going to come on and, and bring some Cayman love to our show. So I uh, look forward to that on Sunday. Tune in and have a great rest of the day. Bye, everybody.